Genesis 17. Genesis 17, and we'll be reading the first 14 verses. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Cana as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and all your descendants after you through their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generation He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in the flesh, in your flesh, for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Uh, Now for our hymn of preparation, let us sing the first two stanzas of hymn number 419. For our text this afternoon, we'll be reading from Belgic Confession, Article 34, which is found on page 86 in the back of your hymnal. Page 86. It's entitled, Holy Baptism. And there we read, We believe and confess that Jesus Christ, who is the end of the law, has made an end by the shedding of his blood for all other sheddings of blood which men could or would make as a propitiation or satisfaction for sin. And that he, having abolished circumcision, which was done with blood, has instituted the sacrament of baptism instead thereof, by which we are received into the church of God and separated from all other people in strange religions that we may wholly belong to him whose mark and ensign we bear, and which serves as a testimony to us that he will forever be our gracious God and Father. 
Therefore, he has commanded all those who are his to be baptized with pure water into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, thereby signifying to us that as water washes away the filth of the body when poured upon it and is seen on the body of the baptized when sprinkled upon him, so does the blood of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit internally sprinkle the soul, cleanse it from its sins, and regenerate us from children of wrath unto children of God. Not that this is affected by the external water, but by the sprinkling of the precious blood of the Son of God, who is our Red Sea, through which we must pass to escape the tyranny of Pharaoh, that is, the devil, and to enter into the spiritual land of Cana. The ministers, therefore, on their part, administer the sacrament and that which is visible, but the Lord gives that which is signified by the sacrament, namely, the gifts and invisible grace, washing, cleansing, and purging of our souls of all filth and unrighteousness, renewing our hearts and filling them with all comfort, giving unto us a true assurance of his fatherly goodness, putting on us the new man and putting off the old man with all its deeds. We believe, therefore, that every man who earnestly studious of, is earnestly studious of obtaining life eternal ought to be baptized, but once with this only baptism, without ever repeating the same, since we cannot be born twice. Neither does this baptism avail us only at the time when the water is poured upon us, and received by us, but also through the whole course of our life. Therefore, we detest the error of the Anabaptists, who are not content with the one only baptism they have received, and moreover condemn the baptism of infants of believers, who we believe ought to be baptized, and sealed with the sign of the covenant, as children in Israel formerly were circumcised upon the same promises which are made to our children. And indeed, Christ shed his blood no less for the washing of the children of believers than for adult persons. And therefore, they ought to receive the sign and sacrament of that which Christ has done for them, as the Lord commanded in the law that they should be made partakers of the sacrament of Christ's suffering and death shortly after they were born by offering for them a lamb, which was the sacrament of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, what circumcision was to the Jews, baptism is to our children. And for this reason, St. Paul calls baptism the circumcision of Christ. The sermon I will be reading this afternoon is written by Reverend Van Olst. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, what do we Reformed Christians believe about baptism, and particularly infant baptism? Do we baptize our children merely out of custom or tradition, or do we truly understand its meaning and significance? What does, does the water of baptism actually wash away sins and infuse saving grace, as taught in the Roman Catholic Church? Can we or do we assume that our children are among the elect because they have been baptized? Why is it that more and more people in the Reformed faith are leaving our church to join evangelical churches and think nothing about being rebaptized? Are we wavering on our view of baptism because of the influence of well respected ministers who advocate believers only baptism? The question of, often arises. So what is the difference between a dedication and baptism? Is it all the same? Lots of questions. And now we come to the longest article of the Belgian Confession, which deals with the sacrament of baptism. And so let us proceed under this theme, the sacraments of baptism, noting first, it replaces circumcision, second, it is a sign, and third, it is a seal. The question is not so much, why baptism? After all, 
as we noted the last time, whatever our understanding on baptism might be, Christians are all agreed that baptism is a sacrament instituted by Christ. The question that divides us is, why do we baptize infants? Where in the New Testament do we find the command or example of a child ever being baptized? Well, truth being, there is no book, chapter, or verse. So why then do we baptize infants? Well, the principal reason that we baptize infants is because baptism has replaced circumcision. Therefore, it is necessary for us to go back to the Old Testament Immediately after the fall of man into sin, God cursed the serpent and told him that from the seed of the woman, the Savior would crush his head. Here we read of God's promise of grace to a lost, fallen humanity. It is this promised grace that God reaffirms with Abraham in the form of a covenant, a binding agreement. Turn with me again to Genesis 17. Genesis 17, verse 7. And there we read, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. God calls this saving relationship an everlasting covenant. God reaffirms this unique relationship with a select people a sinful people, by way of this covenant. Look now with me uh, at verses 10 to 14. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. My covenant shall be in the flesh, in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God gave Abraham a sign, circumcision, a symbol to mark this unique covenant relationship. As we just read, this covenant, this promise was made not just with Abraham, not just with believing adults, not just with immediate male family members, but also included foreigners who were servants in the household. Family bloodlines was not a requirement for receiving God's promise of salvation. Personal faith was not a requirement for receiving God's promise of salvation. So, it, so too it was children, male infants, who on the eighth day were to be given this sign and seal of God's covenant of grace. Infants received the right of circumcision who did not yet believe. Children were not excluded from receiving the promises of God's grace. A personal faith in Jesus was not a requirement for children to receive the promise of God's grace. If we lived in the Old Testament period as believing parents, we would circumcise our children. In fact, not to do so was an act of disobedience. As we read earlier, and the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. As one author uh, points out, here is the choice, be cut or be cut off. Clearly then, circumcision was not optional. Failure to circumcise resulted in excommunication. You were cut off from the promises of God. You were cut off from God's people. The failure to circumcise was a breach of the terms of the covenant. It was an act of willful disobedience. Listen to what we read in Exodus 4, verses 24 and 25. 
And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him, that is Moses, and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he, that is the Lord, let him go. Moses was in violation of the terms and conditions of the covenant of grace. And before Moses could serve as a type of deliverer, he first had to be obedient to observe circumcision within his own household. The failure to do so had almost cost him his life. God made it abundantly clear that circumcision was not an option. It was not some meaningless, empty ritual Certainly not. It was God's promise of salvation to his covenant people in the Old Testament. Yes, you say, but that was the Old Testament. Didn't Christ come to do away with all those blood-related ceremonies? True enough. And this is precisely why in the New Testament, baptism has come in the place of circumcision. With the coming of Christ and the shedding of his precious blood on the cross, the promises of God's covenant of grace are no longer signed and sealed with blood, pointing to the coming of the Messiah. But rather, the promises of God's covenant of grace are now signed and sealed with water, a symbol of cleansing. Baptism has replaced circumcision. But where do we read of this in Scripture? Well, turn with me, please, to Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12. There we read, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God and raised, who raised him from the dead. The debate in the New Testament church of whether Christians needed to be circumcised was answered by Paul, telling them that it was not necessary because baptism had come in the place of circumcision. Baptism is now the sign and seal of being buried and raised with Christ. What was signed and sealed in the Old Testament with the blood of circumcision is now signed and sealed in the New Testament with the water of baptism. And so, with baptism, we continue to follow in the footsteps of the Old Testament by having our children baptized. There is nothing in Scripture to indicate that children of the New Testament believers are suddenly excluded from being heirs to the promises of God's grace. There's no command given by God to stop children from receiving God's covenant promises. Why would God suddenly exclude children of believing parents from his covenant promises? When God made the covenant to Abraham, he made it clear that the promises were to Abraham and his children. And it was to be an everlasting covenant. And so when Peter calls upon the crowd at Pentecost to repent and to be baptized, he includes a key statement with regards to children. In Acts 2, verses 38 and 39, we read, when Peter's, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized, in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are, are far off, as many as the Lord will call. As Peter indicates, the promise of forgiveness, the promise of cleansing, represented in baptism, is extended equally to our children. Children of believing parents are heirs to the promises of God. God holds children of believers in special regard, which is also made clear from 1 Corinthians 7. There we read, But I, 
But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Children of even one believing parent have been made holy, that is, set apart by God. By virtue of the faith of one believing parent, children are heirs to the promises of God. How is this distinction signified? Through baptism. Children who do not yet believe become members of the visible church through baptism. As it says, the entire home is sanctified, set apart through the one believing parent. The entire household in the entire household are the recipients of God's continued favor through the one believing parent. In fact, household baptisms are quite prevalent in the New Testament. We can see examples with the households of Cornelius, Lydia, Stephanus, Cephas, and the Philippian jailer. The place of children within the covenant home and as heirs to God's promises is made clear by Jesus himself who said, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. That's in Matthew 19. As children of the Old Testament were incorporated into God's covenant and made heirs to the promises of God, so too the New, to New Testament teaches us that children are not suddenly excluded until such time as they profess their faith and are baptized. God promised Old Testament and New Testament parents the promises of the covenant are to you and your children. What then is the significance of water, the water of baptism? Well, as we read earlier, baptism is a powerful sign. Water is a symbol of cleansing. And so baptism by water is first of all a reminder that we are all sinners in need of cleansing. The water of baptism is a reminder that this cleansing is a cleansing that God in his grace provides through the sacrifice of his son on the cross by the shedding of his precious blood, by which all our sins are washed away. Furthermore, to quote Daniel Hyde from his book, Jesus Loves the Little Children, the sign of baptism is the water, and not the mode of the water's application. Baptism may be leg legitimately administered by either immersion, sprinkling, or pouring. God chose water, this universal agent of cleansing, to point us to the reality of our sin and the necessity of being cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so baptism is a sign, a visual aid, a picture of the gospel. So too, baptism also functions as a seal. God certifies that the promises signified in the sacrament of baptism are certain. God guarantees them. He sets his seal, his stamp, on what is being promised. The promises are given. The promises are sure. It comes with the assurance that God's promises are true. But as we all know, not everyone who is baptized necessarily embraces God's wonderful promise of grace, which were initially signed and sealed to them at the time of baptism. Jacob and Esau were twins who were born and raised in the same family, circumcised on the eighth day, but in time Esau rejected the promises of the covenant. He showed himself to be a covenant breaker. And so we do not equate covenant or baptism with election. To receive the promises of God is not the same as to actually embrace the promise in true faith. 
one must first be born again. And born again, one must, upon receiving the gift of faith through the power of the Holy Spirit, personally embrace the promises of God in true faith. And so it is clear that baptism as a sign and seal have no power in and of themselves to save. The water of baptism does not wash away sins. The water of baptism does not impart saving grace. The water of baptism does not regenerate us. Well, there is a connection in that they point us to the promises of God. But the water of baptism is a sign, a picture, and a seal, a guarantee of what God promises. But it is still a promise that demands a personal response. The promises of God, signed and sealed at baptism, find their I do's in one's profession of faith. So where did this idea of believers only baptism originate? Interestingly, the writings of the early church fathers suggest that infant baptism was the norm for the first 200 years. In fact, while infant baptism may have been debated, infant baptism was still the norm in the church until the theology of the Anabaptists crept into the church. Robert Booth, in his book, Children of the Promise, quotes Samuel Miller, a Presbyterian professor at Princeton Theological Seminary. The history of the Christian church from the apostolic age furnishes an argument of irresistible force in favor of the divine authority of infant baptism. I can assure you, my friends, with the utmost con candor and confidence, after much careful inquiry on the subject, that for more than 1,500 years after the birth of Christ, there was not a single society of professing Christians on earth who opposed infant baptism on anything like the grounds which distinguish our moder modern Baptist brethren. It is an undoubted fact that the people known in ecclesiastical history under the name the Anabaptists who arose in Germany in the year 1522 were the first body of people in the whole Christian world who rejected the infant baptism. The shift of infant, away from infant baptism to believers-only baptism is consistent with the Arminian man-centered theology. In this man-centered theology, it stands to reason that the focus would shift away from God's grace and his covenant promises, along with the sovereignty to man, man's choice, and man's faith, which is reflected in their view and practice of believers-only baptism. They place a premium on the New Testament at the expense of the Old Testament. What gets lost is the whole concept of the covenant and the continuity of the covenant. There is a disconnect between the Old and the New Testament. But this then raises the question, ought those who have been baptized be rebaptized. Often, rebaptism is a requirement for church membership in evangelical churches who practice believers only baptism. Our response would be, but you already received the promises of God. Were these promises just empty, meaningless promises extended to you to be ignored and disregarded? Does the desire to actually experience baptism? suddenly render infant baptism void or obsolete? Certainly not. R.C. Sproul, in his book, The Essentials of the Christian Faith, notes, because baptism is a sign of God's promise, it is not to be administered to a person more than once. To be baptized more than once is to cast a shadow of doubt on the integrity and sincerity of God's promise. Surely, those who have been baptized two or more times do not intend to cast doubt on God's integrity. But the action, if properly understood, will communicate such doubt. It is every Christian's duty, however, to be baptized. It is not an empty ritual, but a sacrament commanded by our Lord. 
Or as Dr. Venema notes in an article entitled, Should Baptism Ever Be Repeated? How ungrateful it is, therefore, to ignore our covenant God's gracious dealings with us and to say my fir first baptism was of no value. I consider it an empty ceremony that means nothing to me. And I will therefore ask for a second baptism. Scripture nowhere teaches the need for such an encore. Nowhere did God in the Old Testament command a second circumcision, nor did he order a second baptism in the New Testament. Just because we are infants and do not understand the promises of God, it does not mean God excludes children from his promises. The rights of citizenship to a country are given to children even when they do not fully understand them. So too it is with our citizenship in the kingdom of God. And that's the beauty of baptism. Baptism is a sign and seal of the wonderful promises of grace unto salvation given to believers and their children. Children of believers are not in limbo until such time as they come to a true saving faith. No, already as infants, God embraces them and promises to bless them. Baptism points us to God, to God and his amazing grace. What then are the differences between baptism and dedication? Daniel Hyde, in his book, Jesus Loves the Little Children, says, Dedication services then focus attention, the attention of the parents. Sorry. Dedication services then focus attention on the action of the parents. Infant baptism, on the other hand, focuses our attention on our heart and our hearts upon God's action, which we receive through faith alone. The baptize, baptism of children teaches that our children are sinful and that they, along with the congregation, need to trust Christ alone for cleansing from their sins in order to be justified. Whereas dedication looks back and says, we gave you to the Lord, baptism looks back and says, the Lord gave himself to you in the promise of washing away your sins. Whereas dedication says, we will raise you to trust the Lord, baptism says, the Holy Spirit will raise you up from death to life to serve the Lord. The baptism of covenant children is the best dedication service possible because God promises to de dedicate himself to our children. And so as we continue to administer the sacrament of baptism to adults as well as to children, let us do so with understanding and great appreciation for its significance and that it is not some meaningless ritual done out of custom or superstition. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God and most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer to thank you for covenanting with us. We thank you for your covenant faithfulness. We thank you that Jesus has come and has shed his precious blood, that the sign of the covenant of grace is no longer signed with blood, but rather with water, a symbol of the washing away of our sins. We pray that we may cling to the promises of grace sealed to us at baptism, and that we may not see them as an empty ritual. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.